Amen. It's good. <laughs> that brother can memorize scripture. Hallelujah. <laughs> the Bible said, Thy word have I hid in mine heart. Amen. I don't know of a better thing anybody can do than to memorize the word of God. Now, he does a good job of it. Amen. Well, it's good to be here, folks. Uh, if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 with me tonight. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 and verse number 30. 1 Corinthians 1, 30. This is something that I've been kind of mentioning to you the last few days. Tonight we're going to be talking about it. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30, the Scripture says, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. Now note verse 31. That continues, according as it is written, He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord, not himself or his abilities. So now let's look at the concept for just a moment. Look at the book of uh, John chapter number 11 and verse number 25. John eleven twenty five, Jesus saith to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. He didn't say a thing about raising the dead. He said, I am the resurrection. He doesn't do it. He is it. <laughs> that's not good grammar, but that's what he said. I'm the resurrection. Now, go with me to the book of uh, Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 14. Um, this is not exhaustive because um, there are many more, but I just want to give you these tonight to give you an idea of what's going on here. Ephesians chapter number 2 and verse number 14. For He is our peace, who hath made both one, hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Notice carefully. It's not so much that He gives you peace. He is your peace. All right. Now, Hebrews chapter number 4 and verse number 1. In the book of Hebrews, chapter number 4, verse 1. In Hebrews 4, 1, the Scripture says, Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering into His rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Look at verse 9. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. Now in all of the places that I've given you so far tonight, the, th the thing that is so desirable and the thing that is to have is not what He does for you. It's who He is. So in Hebrews chapter number 4, I would think that the rest is Christ Himself. Yes, I do. In Colossians chapter number 3 and verse number 4, the Scripture says, When Christ, who is our life, do you see that? He said, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. But when you begin to run the references on it, you find out what he says is, I'm giving to them myself. You see what I mean? When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Now I want to read you a couple of uh, prayer requests that I get on the internet. I get these all the time, every day, daily. And... Uh, you know the web page. Uh, I'll keep uh, these folks anonymous. Um, I have no intentions of embarrassing anyone, but I want you to listen carefully now to what I'm going to read you tonight. This is the real world, okay? This is not feel-good churchianity. This is the real world. These are real people living in a real world that have problems. He says, I need deliverance from homosexuality, pride, and any all attacks by the enemy on me. I used to serve the Lord, but now I'm living in sin. I haven't listened to the Lord 
and now I feel no conviction. I'm dead inside, and I don't know what to do. I feel like he has given up on me, and it's my fault for living in willful sin. I don't know anything anymore. I don't want to go to hell. That's a real person. That's a real person. Okay? What would you say to someone like that? Now, this came in just a couple of days ago. Came in, as a matter of fact, I think it, uh, a couple of days ago. I answered this lady today. Here's what she said in desperation Can someone please help me? I said the sinner's prayer when I was nine years old. <clears throat> but I've done more bad than good since that time. I'm 32 now. I know that Jesus is my only hope. I know that Jesus is my only redemption. And I know he's the only way to God. But I don't know I'm saved and going to heaven. And the confusion over it all is wearing me down. I was raised in a wonderful Southern Baptist church in such and such a place, just outside of such and such a place. But I'm more confused now than ever, and I'm terrified. Did you get that? I'm terrified. She's full of terror. Now, if you've never been terrified, not knowing where you're going when you leave this world, you don't understand this woman. I'm terrified. I lay awake at night and worry. And I feel so bad for not living for Christ. I can't take this much longer. I've asked people for help, but I never seem to get a clear answer. I just want some peace. Could you call me or email me, please, as quickly as possible? My name is so-and-so, my number so-and-so. Please pray for me. God and prayer are my only hope, I know. Here's how I answered her. Read the Gospel of John slowly. As you read, ask yourself if you really believe what you have read. When you are finished, tell the Lord that you believe His Word and that you want a relationship with Him. Tell Him that you are ready to confess any sin He brings to your mind. Tell him that you want to be saved. Confess that you are a sinner that wants mercy. Don't rely on any previous experience with God. That will come as the Holy Spirit builds a relationship between you and God. The new birth is a real experience that can be counterfeited. God will not lie to you. A broken and contrite spirit is of great value to him. Approach him in meekness. Your flesh will fight you. You will be diverted to some other spiritual thing. You will be told that all of this is unnecessary. You will encounter opposition. Press on. He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I will be praying for you. Did I give her good counsel? She responded immediately. I sent this out this afternoon, and I got a response from her in, in an hour. She responded immediately and told me how much she appreciated the fact that I responded to her spiritual welfare need. I did not tell her that she had never been saved. I did not tell her that her experience at nine was not legitimate. That's not what I said. I just said, ask him to save you. No, seek him, seek him, pray to him. God, save me. You remember what I said to you a moment ago? The Bible says that, by, that you are saved by his life. This is the life that he lives at the right hand of the Father, interceding for you as our high priest, who is saving your daily life. Your soul can only, your spirit can only be born again one time, one time, one time. But your daily walk, 
This salvation in the New Testament that's used, and I didn't mean to get off into all this tonight, but I've got to bring it out since I'm on this. New Testament salvation is a multifaceted thing. The new birth is a once and for all finished event that will never be changed. If you are born of the Spirit, you are born of the Spirit. But there are many people that are born again that have a lost soul, a lost, wasted life. Do you agree? They've been saved, but somewhere they fell through the cracks and their life is in destruction. And this is what John talks about in 1 John 5. If you see a brother sinning a sin unto death, he didn't say what sin, because the individual sin is not the issue. It's the state of being that the individual has reached. If you see him sin a sin unto death, don't pray for him because he's leaving this world. So what do you do? You cry out to God for mercy and meekness. And that's what brings me into what I'm talking about in here tonight. This lesson tonight can be a very important type lesson. It's the kind of thing that can help you because it deals with real spiritual issues. You get tired of hearing cliches and hackneyed expressions and worn out, uh, you know, worn out, worked over uh, 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 formulas. Formulas don't work with God. What works with God is a heart that's ready to receive Him. And whatever's necessary to get you there, get you there. That's what I told her. Whatever needs to be done, let him do it. Let's look at it tonight. All of these things Christ Jesus can be to us. He can be our life. He can be my righteousness. He can be my rest. He can be my joy. He can be my victory. I mean, all of these things. He has made to me wisdom. He can be my, he can be, he can be, the, and obviously he is the resurrection. I've already been raised in him. But you see, the average person and the carnal mind always tries to find these things outside of him, even though they're a true believer in him. Because they can put their hand on it or they can talk about it. They can focus on it like it's an issue. It's not an issue. It's a person. There is no righteousness outside the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And all of the righteousness that means anything in the New Testament is the righteousness of the Son of God. His righteousness is a righteousness that was lived out on this earth 2,000 years ago. It was the righteousness of a God-man, the God-man. And it is by that righteousness, now this is important, He ascended into the very presence of Almighty God on, by virtue of His righteousness. The righteous one. So, how do we receive that? You pray for it. You pray for these things. But for some reason, they don't seem to become a reality to you. Pray for victory, but victory just seems to escape you. Pray for peace, but you're in turmoil. You pray for, you pray for God to forgive you of your sin. Go right back out and do the same thing again. So there's no victory. There's, no, there's nothing in there to give you power. Do you believe there's power in the Holy Spirit? Yes. Folks, this Christian life is not is not where a, a person makes up their mind and lives by mind power and the force of the will. That's a bunch of garbage. The Christian life, we live by the power of the Holy Spirit, just like He did. Everything He did and every, every breath He drew and all that He was, He was by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. Third person of the Godhead. Uh, there's an issue that does it. There's something that is the channel whereby grace, whereby God is able to minister these things to us from Christ, and it's called grace. Now, most folks, when they use the term grace, they use it like this. For by grace are you saved through faith. It's not of yourselves, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. All right? You hath he quickened who were dead in sins and trespasses, Ephesians 2. In other words, you use grace and limit grace as it only relates to salvation. Are you agree? 90% of the time when the word grace comes up, aha, salvation. Well, it is, certainly is that. No question about that. Absolutely. Without the grace of God, there's no salvation. But the grace of God is far more than just salvation. Far more. The Apostle Paul, when he writes to the churches, he tells them how they minister's grace. I minister grace. I minister grace. But he's not talking about being saved. He's talking about ministering something spiritual to them. 
by grace, by the grace of God, the grace of God. You say, well then preacher, I want the grace of God working in my life. Well, I do too, don't you? The book of Romans chapter number 5 and verse number 15. It says this, Romans 5, 15. It says, but not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. What is the gift by grace? What would you think that would be? Obviously it's salvation, but what is the gift? Christ. <laughs> he gives you the Lord Jesus. Amen. That's salvation. Amen. The moment you were born again, you received the Lord Jesus Christ. Yeah. But the problem is that when you receive Him, a lot of people, they truly receive Him, but He becomes an intellectual thing, and He's not really the heart and soul and mind and spirit and being of the believer. You realize, folks, that if you are a real New Testament Christian, you are absolutely insane about Jesus Christ. You are literally blown away by Him. I mean, He absolutely takes up the waking moments of your life. You are, you are absolutely head over heels in love with Him. That He has become the most precious thing to you that you'll ever know in this world and the world to come is the Son of God. And if He's not, the Holy Ghost can make Him that. Because you see, the Holy Spirit is the instrument of God, the power of God to work the work of God. It all comes from the Father by the Son through the Holy Ghost. From the Father issues forth by the Son. All things were made by Christ from the Father by the power of the Holy Spirit. You see how they work? So when He's the Spirit of truth has come, He'll guide you into all truth. But now look at Romans 5, 17. It says, For if by one man's offense death reign by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Now what does that mean? Is that salvation or does that go past salvation? It goes beyond salvation and it goes to where you have an abundance of grace that we shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Now obviously we know that we're going to reign in the millennium. But if you receive this abundance of grace in this life, by receiving that grace from God, you can receive everything that the Lord Jesus Christ is supposed to be to you. <clears throat> Most Christians are seeking something and they don't realize that they already have Him. They already have Him. What they need is for the Holy Spirit to take the blinders away from their eyes and begin to show them how that the problem is not what God's given us. He's already given it to us. The problem is us. It's our, our inability to receive what He's given us. And He's already laid it out. It's pretty simple the way God deals with stuff like this, but you know, sometimes uh, even the God of this world that blinded the minds of them that believe not, He can work a good work on us too to blind us if possible to Christ and who He is to us because He's everything to us. In the book of Romans chapter number 12 and verse number 3, here's what the Apostle Paul says about this. He says, For I say, watch this, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think soberly according as God hath dealt to every man the measure of faith. Well, what would this grace be? This would be the grace not only of the ability to teach, because Paul was a marvelous teacher. No doubt. You believe that? Yes, sir. Paul was a teacher, but he was also an inspired writer, because not only did he teach, for example, Polycarp taught, but Polycarp did not write Scripture. Irenaeus taught, but Irenaeus did not write Scripture. But Paul teaches and he writes Scripture by the grace given unto him. In other words, his ability to receive what God has to do for him and through him. Now, I want to get down to what we have to deal with here then. Turn to James chapter number 4. 
the book of James. Now let me explain something about James. A lot of people have a, ha a lot of trouble with James. They, they, they say James teaches work salvation. No, he doesn't. He wouldn't be in the Holy Scripture if he did. <clears throat> he wouldn't be in here. James does not teach work salvation. What James teaches is the manifestation of real salvation. Get it out of your intellect and let it produce something. The Bible says he work the Bible says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's what it says. Work it out. Work out your own salvation. It's good for you to know that if you really do possess something that you think you possess, it's going to produce something in you. The Bible said we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto what? Good. Unto good works. Yeah. Unto good works. There should be a desire in every Christian to see somebody born again, to help somebody, to be an intercessor for somebody, to give a drink of water, some food, or something to help someone in this world because this world is dying. It is dying. It is the land of the dying. And the only light in this world is the Lord Jesus Christ as He shines through His believers. So in the book of James chapter number 4 and verse number 5, watch this carefully. Do you think that the Scripture saith in vain, the Spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? And envy is a horrible monster. But he, watch this. But He giveth more what? Grace. Wherefore he saith. Now how does he give it? Look, watch this. He giveth more grace. He gives you what you need to receive what you must have. You can't do it with your mind. You've got to do it God's way. And there's only one way. He giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith. God resisteth the proud. But giveth grace unto the humble. There's your grace. Humility. Now oh, that's a hard one. Because our natural inclination is to pride, ego, self, pump self up, I am that I am. Well, I'm nothing. He is that He is. And because He is what He is, I am what I am. <laughs> but without Him, I'm nothing. So when He declares, I am that I am, He is saying, I am the all-sufficient one. I exist because I exist. I need nothing from the outside. But I can't say that and you can't say that because we must have him. So the Bible says here that he resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Now look at verse 7 and look who shows up. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist who? And he will flee from you. You know why he shows up here? Because Satan has a door swing wide open to him in any soul that he finds full of pride. That's an invitation. You're inviting the devil to come in and sift you like wheat. He sifted Peter. He sure did. Peter denied him three times and then that cock crew, when that cock crew, the apostle Peter went out, went out into the field and went off away and he was crying bitter tears. It was his pride that said, Lord, I'll never deny you. And the Lord Jesus looked at Peter and he could have said this to him. He said, Peter, you mean well, but you don't understand what's going on inside your heart and your soul. You don't realize how unstable you are. You don't realize you don't have the, you don't have the foundation you think you have. You don't have it yet. When you are converted, then you can strengthen your brethren, but you haven't been converted yet. The conversion he's talking about is not necessarily the new birth. He's talking about going back into the field, weeping, and coming back out of that field and writing First and Second Peter. And here's what he said to him after all of that, too. He said, Peter, lovest thou me more than thee? Yea, Lord, you know I love you. What did he say to Peter? Feed my sheep. And he fed us. When he wrote First and Second Peter, he fed us. He fed us. But he had to come to the bottom of himself and find out who he was to produce real humility. Peter says a lot about humility. Look over here in 1 Peter chapter number 5 and verse 5. He says, Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. That sounds just like James. But God giveth grace unto the humble, James 4, 5. 1 Peter 5, 5. For God giveth grace unto the humble, 
1 Peter 5, 5. The only difference is he doesn't have God, but he says, God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. So what does that mean? <laughs> that means that you have a choice to make, that you know that you don't have these things the New Testament says you need, that only can be produced by Christ coming alive in your life, and you can't do it on your own. You can't do it by willpower. You can't do it by commanding demons. The only way you can do it is to humble yourself. Now in James 4, 5, he says this in verse 7, Submit yourselves therefore to God. The word submit right here is a very interesting word. Here's what it means. It means to acknowledge His superiority, His superiority to you and His authority over you and yield to it. His superiority, is God superior to you? And yield, bow down, bend the knee, drop the head, throw up the flag, white flag. I'll no longer fight you and I'll no longer resist you. I know I want this, but if you're not going to give me what I want, I'm going to yield myself to you and I'm going to allow you to start taking control of my life and I'm going to allow you to be the one that make the decisions. And the very moment you do that, a great peace will come into your soul. But more than that, the great peace is Christ Himself. And then a rest follows in its place. You no longer struggle and fight. You no longer strive. Now you are at peace and at rest. And now life begins to flood into your heart and into your soul, the life of Christ. Now you can begin to focus your attention and affections on things above and not on things on the earth. Now you begin to see Christ as the glorified, risen, holy Son of God, seated at the right hand of the Father. These things are no longer doctrines. They are a way of life. They become a reality to you. But you've got to humble yourself. And it's not easy to do. These things aren't easy. They're not easy. This, this, this humbling of yourself is when you, uh, is when you give up. It's when you've been brought to the point to where you know that there's nothing you're going to be able to do to change the situation. Yeah. Not a thing you can do. And if you try to do anything else, you're going to make it worse. And you give up. You give up. This lady that I sent that back to, I hope she understands that when she got, gets through reading the Gospel of John, it's all written for her to believe. And if she says, I do believe that. I believe this. I believe this. I believe this. I believe this. I believe what I have read. Then God says in 1 John 5, you have believed the record that I've given of my son. Yeah. Now that you've believed the record, you can receive the power of the Holy Spirit to do what he can do in you. You see, God doesn't ask you to produce faith even to be saved by. The faith that you're saved by is received by grace. The way it is received by grace, if you are willing to repent, if you are convicted and willing to repent in your heart of your sin, you've been convicted of it. You're not going to fight God. You're not going to make excuses for it. You're going to say, Lord, I might have been molested when I was a child. My wife might have walked off with another man. I might have, I might have, I might, I might have started using drugs against what my parents told me to do. I might have tried everything in this world and a lot of people might have contributed to it, but I'm not blaming anybody. I'm taking all the blame myself because I made the choices. It's me, oh Lord. God help me. No excuses. No excuses. I need help. Then the channel has opened for you to receive grace. And that grace that you're receiving is the grace that brings saving faith. And that saving faith is when the Holy Spirit moves in your heart and says, now here is the remedy for your problem. Put your trust in Jesus. The Lord Jesus Christ died for Adolf Hitler. The Lord Jesus Christ died for Joseph Stalin. The Lord Jesus Christ died for every monster that ever walked the face of this earth. For the Bible said, by the grace of God, he should taste death for every man. Every man. He tasted Hitler's death. He tasted Mussolini's death. 
He tasted the death of the tyrant. He, he tasted the death of John Gacy, a cannibal, homosexual. He tasted the death of the most heinous that ever walked the face of the earth. And he tasted your death and my death. Amen. 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 And he'll save to the uttermost. So if you want to receive something from, something from him, what you say to him tonight is, Lord, I'm sick and tired of this religious cliche garbage coming out of my mouth, but my life doesn't bear any fruit. There's no change. And what that preacher says is true. I don't like it, but I know what he's saying is true. My, the fault is with me. The fault is mine. As my grandfather used to say when I did something wrong, he used to say this to me all the time. He said, own up to it. You don't hear anybody say that today, but back then, he said, own up to it. I remember that back as far as I can remember anything. Own up to it. In other words, don't make excuses and don't blame somebody else. You did it. <laughs> and I've got a scar right here that long. He threw a pot from here to that wall back there. And just the moment I turned around, I was running from him. That pot hit me right here in the head. That happened 60 years ago. <laughs> I'll never forget that. Now, if he'd done that today, they'd come and get him and throw him in jail, lock him up, you know, and everybody gets so upset. But I learned a lesson. I learned a lesson. I learned a lesson. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I learned a lesson. I shot my brother with a BB gun. <laughs> we were playing cowboys and Indians. <laughs> I didn't never shot him again. <laughs> no more. <laughs> no moss. <laughs> No more shooting with BB guns. <laughs> it's dangerous, though. You could put an eye out with a BB gun. <laughs> we were just rough boys playing, you know, cowboys and Indians. That's the way kids are. Two boys out in the woods out there off Ford Valley Road. <laughs> but that pot, <laughs> I, can, I can still remember it to this day. <laughs> can you imagine me that far? I'm not kidding you. I was 60 feet from him, and he threw that pot at me. And I was running as far as I, hard as I could go. And the moment I turned around, <laughs> cut me right in the head. That was God. <laughs> that was God. <laughs> that was God. I needed it. <laughs> Amen. I owned up to it. <laughs> That's what you got to do, folks. You got to own up to the fact. I don't know what your circumstances, who the, who's influencing you, and who's messing around with you, and who's who's after you and what have you. But the thing is, in order for the Lord Jesus Christ to become all that we want him to be and what he, and we're desperate, we need him. We need him. Then we have to receive grace. And the only way you can receive grace, and I'm talking about the grace that ministers Christ to you for this life. The only way to receive that grace is by humbling yourself. And you submit yourself to his authority and say, Lord, you're God. Amen. Therefore, when you do that, he'll deal with you as with a son. Aren't you glad? I'm glad he deals with me as a son and not as some pagan, heathen. As I say around here, heathen. <laughs> he deals with me as with a son. Amen. Father, in thy name we pray. Bless your word. Bless it, Father. May it take root, Lord. God, may it produce fruit in due time. The seed's good, Father. The seed's good. I sowed good seed tonight. I got full confidence in that seed. That's perfect seed. It's holy seed. It's inspired seed, Lord. That seed's the very Word of God. Now, the vessel that sowed it's not much, but the seed, oh, the seed. The seed's good. The seed's good. Now, Heavenly Father, in your time and your way, bring forth fruit from it. And glorify yourself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.